Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Revolution will not be televised. It will be streamed. This is the place where we talk about life and leadership in a digital world. And oh, what a world it has been. Uh, to say these are unprecedented times is almost a misnomer. Um, it's definitely unparalleled times. I believe it's times that's filled with possibilities and opportunities uh, that we've never imagined before, which requires that we reimagine our world and our lives. And so it's a joy to be with you. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Ricky Allman, along with my fellow host, uh, the Reverend Stephen J. Thurston II. How you doing, man? All's well, man. Always good to see you. It's a Connect pleasure to see you. Th man. Thank you for still being willing to hang out with me. We we almost 40 weeks deep in this thing. Yes, sir. And uh, and we're and still we're, having fun. We're having fun and, and we're helping people as, as we go along. Yes. Uh, and that's what it's all about. Uh, I, I want us to mention two things. First of all, um, go ahead and introduce our, our guests before we even tell them who this show is for. The reason I want to do this is because I want to I want us to just pause uh, for, for a special moment uh, today. So if you'll introduce our guest, Stephen, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take this moment to, to recognize a giant. Uh, sure, let's do it, man. It on this on this conversation today. Cool, man. Well, I mean, we've got two two great pastors uh, in the Chicago area. One is now a global pastor uh, because he no longer has a building, and we're gonna get into that <laughs> in a second. His his church is everywhere at the same time. He's got the first I'm not present church. <laughs> he has sold the church. Just he sold, sold the, the church. church. <laughs> so, Pastor Clarence Stores, we're excited to have uh, this genius. Uh, of, of a guy to share with us, to drop nuggets that's going to help us to grow and be better. And then Pastor Bill Ellis, uh, great guy, great preacher, great soul, great spirit. In Anything else you want to put behind great, it fits Bill. And we're excited to have him here uh, to share his insight, his perspective, and how he has navigated coming through a lineage of preaching uh, to, to stamp out his territory, to leave his mark not, not a scar, but a mark in the lives of people that he seeks to minister to on a weekly basis. And so with that said, I, I want us to take a moment uh, to recognize and honor and celebrate uh, Bill's father, uh, the, the bishop that, that literally, when I use the word inimitable, uh, <laughs> it is literally impossible to imitate <laughs> without it looking like phony patronage, Bishop <laughs> William Ellis, who we call yes. Bishop E because I've been set free. Set free. Uh, yes, sir. His, his personality, his charisma, uh, in, in some of my conversations with Bill, just brother to brother, uh, when he describes his father affectionately and just talks about his presence, uh, when if Bishop E walked into a service, uh, yeah, you knew church was getting ready to happen. Like that's when it started. <laughs> no matter what was happening before that, yeah. church is getting ready to happen. And so, Bill, I just want you to know, sir, uh, we celebrate you and your family. We're praying with you, your family, your church, uh, but we honor your father and uh, thank you all for sharing him with the world. Uh, sure. You you made it possible for us to benefit uh, from his life. So we, we had to take a moment just to to acknowledge him. And so uh, I wanted us to do that. If you don't know who Bishop William Ellis is, just go to YouTube. That's all I'm going to say. That's uh, it. It's going to come up. And I promise you, especially in the midst of this pandemic, you're going to get some yeah. joy in your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. It's going to pick you up. So, Stephen. Today, our subject is the kingdom has gone wild. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. If, if you don't have context, go back to episode 30. Uh, we had both of these gentlemen on and we were dealing with the subject, thy kingdom come and the conversation got so good. Uh, we had to have an encore. And so we're back today, uh, but we're talking about the kingdom gone wild. Uh, so, Stephen, tell us who this conversation is for before we get into it. 
Sure. Man, we're focused in on individuals at all walks of life, all stages of life, be you a CEO, uh, educator, uh, in poli politics, pastor, uh, you're just doing life, you're living, but you're in a space and place in life where you want to maximize your potential, mobilize your purpose and multiply your productivity. This is the space and the place, the group that you need to be plugged into. So make sure that you're inviting more like-minded people to join this Facebook group uh, because revolution ain't being televised, it's being streamed. And who knows, Rick, by the time we get out of this, we may have taken streaming out and we may be on to something, something else. I'm trying so to take this. This if thing has, be, has shifted on us. Yeah. If you're forward thinking, this is the space and the place for you to flush out ideas. It's a safe space where we can be free to talk about what isn't talked about in so many spaces that conversations need to be have had. So welcome to the revolution. Let's dive into this thing. This, this thing. It. Yeah, this is the wild, wild west. If any of you paid attention <laughs> in history, about how things were when they were just going west and discovering new land and new possibilities and opportunities. That's what the ministry space looks like. Pastor Storrs, we gotta start with you. Uh, for those who didn't tune in last time, this groundbreaking revolutionary news that you dropped on us. Man, give it to us again and tell us what's been the feedback since you made this monumental decision. Awesome, man. Once again, thank you all for allowing the old guy Man, I don't know why part. you keep, you know what? You're <laughs> insulting us now. You come on here looking 25 and uh, the old, stop it. You, you <laughs> probably colored your beard gray just to, you know, try to make your point. <laughs> oh yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. And staying around young, innovative millennials along with Gen Zers and all of the above keeps me, keeps me young, man. Right. So I love that. Uh, again, glad to be here uh, with my brothers to converse about matters that pertain to the <clears> kingdom. <throat> so if I could walk you through uh, real quickly the timeline yes. on how we got to the, the jaw-dropping, the shocking <laughs> uh, sentiment of uh, selling our building. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, when we start exploring the possibility of streaming, I got a lot of pushback from uh, my colleagues, along with a few of our diehard members. For those who don't know, I'm a second generation pastor, 22 years in, following my dad, who had passed it for 30 plus years. So uh, in our 57 year history, uh, we're the only two pastors. Wow. And we start exploring the, the possibility of streaming and fast forward to 20. Uh, this was 2008, and we were talking about this a little bit over 10 years ago. And at that time, we were planning to expand a footprint, footprint of our church by purchasing the property that was contiguous to our church going east. So we were going to buy the whole block and expand our footprint. Man, but something uh, wasn't sitting right. And for me, I, uh, I look at the trends, a modern-day son of Issachar, and I saw that housing prices were rising, but wages were stagnant or declining. And I'm like, this pace can't last. So 2008, uh, the recession hit and we had shelved our plans to build and wanted to build out our small group ministry. So fast forward to 2010, this thing, Facebook starts taking off and then they bring in the, the ability to do Facebook live and all of the above. So in 2013 is when we start streaming our services uh, to Facebook and we were actually streaming the, the live uh, service. And man, did I get pushed back on that because the blowback was you're taking people out of the building. And I'm like, well, if you look at our trends, we were going this way as far as attendance. So I'm like, they wouldn't come in anyway. So we wow. might as well build something that they could 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 attest to. And so uh, one meeting, I'll never forget, I held up my phone. I said, this thing, trust me, is going to revolutionize the way we do church because no one leaves home without it. And you see people dialed in. I said, what if we can go to where they are? That's the modern day well. If we can go to where they are, 
and then have a, a package ready, you know, for people. And so that's when we start developing our app and we just start pushing uh, things towards um, online. So fast forward to, to February of 2020. We have been streaming since 2013. And when we got the stay at home order, all we did was flip the switch because that's what we were doing anyway. So now all <laughs> of my members and leaders and, 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 and the past has kind of been slow to come around. We're saying, man, you were right. Um, you saw this before it was happening. And if you follow the trends, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, if you follow the trends, there's a crisis every 10 years yes. within the U.S. or within the world. Think about it. 2001, 9-11, 2008, 09, the Great Recession, 2020, COVID-19. So for the leader who doesn't have their finger on the pulse of the moment to know that every 10 years a crisis is coming, I'll say this. The future is kind to the leader that's unprepared. The future is unkind to the leader that's unprepared. Yeah. So that's our story. That's how it all came about. <laughs> so so what, what finally brought you to the head of selling your building? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to give uh, context. Oh, no, we appreciate how we Thank got yes. to where we are. So the second part in all of that, um, we were actually in the middle of a church-wide campaign called All In. And it was a hybrid capital campaign where we were raising money to run our vision on parallel tracks. And I take that from the fact that I believe God gives us multiple ways to pursue uh, his plan. He doesn't lock us into just one plan. So the parallel uh, plan track was we would raise funds to either renovate our building or to purchase a new building. So therefore, we were running a both end. If, if God saw fit to keep us in this space, we'll raise money and renovate. And then if God saw fit for us to sell it and get into something more modern, we pursue it. So we pursued both tracks and everything was going well even post covid in in running this campaign so after covid hit and we had our building on the market out of nowhere i promise you we have been praying because my secret desire was i don't want this building anymore it's, it's too expensive it's 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 underutilized we did a facility audit we were only using 40% wow. of the building and we were only using it three to four days out of the week. So uh, God raised up, man, three bidders. And uh, these three bidders were two developers in one church. And we just let them go at it, go back and forth uh, towards the uh, bidding and finally settled on one under contract set to close on December the 18th. And the beautiful part about all of this, number one, we were debt free. Uh, number two, our expenses are almost non-existent. So we get a chance to utilize those resources, you know, for further kingdom expansion. And uh, I don't feel bad at all. Actually, um, man, I feel great not knowing that I have this, this building, this burden uh, that's on our back and the entrepreneurial side of me says, sit tight, sit tight, because there will be some great bargains <laughs> on facilities over the course of the next year or so. Along with that thought, and this is really going to rattle some cages, and, and I'm going to give a disclaimer, consider your context and your culture before I say this. We're not sure at Mars Hill, if we're going to meet every Sunday, once post COVID ends. Question is, if Amazon can have a hybrid approach, and what I mean by that, Amazon was a digital company, 
before they became physical. And if you look at Target, all of these other places, you begin the conversation online by searching for something that you want. You put it in your cart, and then an hour later, you can go pick it up, or they can bring it to you. So for us, we're not convinced that every Sunday will work for us since we have a strong digital ministry. So right now, preliminarily, we will meet uh, every first Sunday, of course, for high church, communion, all of the above, with the subsequent Sundays being online. Can I join your church today, Stuart? <laughs> will you open the doors in church today. right now for me to join? <laughs> Man, we're Mars Hill anywhere. Right. So we have friends, partners. Uh, you see it right? Where is it right down here? Yes, yeah. sir. Over there. <laughs> but that's 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 who we are, and that's the direction that we go. Now, I could be wrong, and and I told our leadership that, but two things I know. Number one, pioneers always take the first arrows in the back, and two as long as I have leaders who are willing to pull the arrows out my back and dress my wounds, wow. we'll yes, keep sir. moving forward. Right. Mm. I love but it. I'll tell you this. It, it, it literally sounds like thy kingdom come. I mean, that's, I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure that you have not hit the pulse of what Jesus intends anyway. When, when you talk about the kingdom and one of the things you said with selling your building course, this is not for everybody just to go do. It doesn't mean that you're any less kingdom driven because you don't sell your building. You may have different needs, the size of your congregation, the community you're in, all of those factors. So we're not saying in order for you to be in sync with the kingdom, you got to sell your building. That's not what we're telling you. Right. What we are saying is you got to make sure that your priorities are congruent with you facilitating ministry in the most efficient and effective way and making sure that the needs of the people are the first priority, which is what Christ cares about the most. So with that segue, uh, Pastor William Ellis, uh, I, I, there's some people watching this who say, you know, I've been doing church and and, and maybe they're like all of us because all of us are second, third, fourth generation leaders and pastors without exception. But there may be somebody out there who say, you know, I've, I've been doing church, but I this concept of the kingdom is new to me or foreign to me. Uh, talk, talk about, give definition, Bill, to what we mean when we say the kingdom of God. Okay, uh, thank you for asking me that question. And gentlemen, My thank pleasure. you for having me. Man, uh, this is amazing. Um, thank you for honoring my father. And I think I can start right there. Yes, I've sir. noticed the irony that all of us here today um, are spinoffs of our fathers. We're the juniors that are here today. Yeah. Um, yeah. We all had high top fades and parts in our hair at one time. <laughs> hey, stop telling all our business. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us now. And, uh, yeah, right. Pastor Stowers ran through every 10 years, the church sees something different. Well, that just made me think about something. That sets a clear marker of recognizing that, you know, the world sees some event every 10 years to place a, a marker for us to say, this is what we did since that happened, or this is what happened to cause us to make the necessary adjustments to continue to be both progressive and productive. But then does the church have that marker and or does the kingdom have that marker? Uh, and Ricky, you asked me the question and let me just go from my own um, experience. Please. And that is, um, I was introduced to the church before I never knew anything about the kingdom. Wow. Um, I, I, I was, I'm the son of, I'm the son of the son of a founder. And, and like you said, go to YouTube and especially now, man, you said it in this quarantine season, 
there was a season uh, in the late night in the early two thousands for about probably four to five years on Saturday at noon, all the church world was tuned into the word network to watch the apostolic Pentecostal church of Morgan park. As I like to call it the Bishop E show Bishop E cause I've been set free. You got to say the whole thing. <laughs> so we've had all the church we can have, mm. but I think we still don't understand what the kingdom is. Wow. We don't know what the kingdom is. Yeah. We believe too much and we know too little. Hmm. Whoa, whoa. So don't, we've don't, got... I, 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 don't you rush past that. Yes, sir. I need you to I'm say sorry. that one more time. I need you to say it in slow jam style. Please. <laughs> All right. It's uh, something that, that that started me on this course of, I guess you can say, enlightenment, revelation. Right. Well, my bishop said it to me that we believe too much and we know too little. Um, Jesus can't think. I love when you do that, man. It makes me feel like I'm... <laughs> In the pre-salvation, it, it, that was horn Steven, words you know right that there. In <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, but it, it's it's because we're born into church and we learn how to do church, right? Yeah. And then we don't we don't at least for me, I didn't discover anything about what it meant to even have a kingdom vernacular. For me, even after sort of tiptoeing through seminary and all of that. But it was one preacher who shifted my entire uh, purview of understanding the kingdom dynamics and even how Jesus rep represented and reflected what he meant. Um, and that was Bishop Veron Ash. I'd never heard that the kingdom of God was about proximity. Um, all I heard was you get saved and now you saved, you need to serve. But then understanding that serving meant not just serving those in the house or the household of faith. Yes, that is the place where we should emphasize uh, our love, our generosity and our care, but then it should intentionally expand and unfold beyond the four walls of the building concept, beyond the Americanized institutional church concept. And it should extend into what Jesus intentionally came to establish. And that was a kingdom on the earth. Well, um, I'll say this, here's a bigger challenge in America. It's our theological exposition of what the kingdom is because we aren't a monarchy. We've never been a monarchy. And in fact, our democracy is in jeopardy right now. Right. So um, I, I believe what the church is running into now is the same issue that the people back in Jesus day were running into. And that is Jesus came to establish a mission, a message, and a method that could be regurgitated, that could be reproduced, that could be recapitulated by all human beings. But the people that he came to talk to and tell them how to have an actual better life in a, in a, in a, in a debaucherous society, they got disappointed because they said, well, all that sounds good, but when can we vote for you? <laughs> oh, that sounds wow. good. But when are you going to do what we yes. expected you to do, what we wanted you to do? And so Jesus is saying, well, I know what you all expected me to do and wanted me to do, but that's not what I'm here to do. So what do we do now? Let's bring it now, especially in our black church culture. When the black church means to black people, something that has nothing to do with the kingdom because we don't even understand how to articulate that theology in our reality. So for me, it's let's understand kingdom, let's understand church, and let's understand society. And then if we learn how to marry those three things because a threefold cord is not easily broken, and I believe we'll be a better people as humans, we'll be a better people as people of God and and we can have heaven here on earth instead of waiting to try to get our pie in the sky. Can we get another air horn, Rick? Because yes, everything Lord. Bill just said. Yes. 
Let me say this too. That's what I man. This is with Star Wars though. He's got me going. You got me going, Star Wars. You got me <laughs> because. Am I saying it right? Stowers or stores? Stores. Yeah, stores, but stores. it's all good. I've I've heard all variations and I respond to them both. <laughs> that, that's like me. I've heard almond, almond. You, 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 they, yeah. Well, stores stores said though, but you know, 57 years, one church, he's the second pastor. Um, was that, that church always in one location? It's our third location. Third location. Okay, so you've moved around. Okay. I'm the fourth pastor of a church that is 97 years old, that's been in one location. Wow. And I'll be very candid because I came into a situation where uh, uh, when you, you know, when you take over a ministry, you have to transition all the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, so I came into a church that was 97 years old, one location, 114th and Vincennes has been in that one location. Well, I came in saying very well what you're saying. Attendance is down. This, you know, times are changing and shifting. Uh, we have two buildings and five floors worth of space. And we have church twice a week. So beginning to look at all of this, you talked about facility audits. Well, what are we? So we had a church in a church building, but what are we actually doing with it? And what are we using it for? And in conversation with several different pastors in the city, because very realistically, we're talking about, well, downsizing. Let's downsize, man. We don't need all this space and place. We don't have to stress ourselves out. We can have more capital to actually do ministry instead yes. of having the building sucking up all the budget. So what does it look like if we move? And, and the pastor said to me, he said, he, says, uh, uh, he says, before I make you an offer to buy your church, <laughs> I want you to consider this. He says, uh, you know, I've had to move a congregation once or twice, but I'm the founder. He says, you're going to have to move a congregation that has never moved. And that's all going to be your responsibility. I said, oh, hold on. Let's pump the brakes on that whole idea. Ball that plan up, throw it in the trash. We got to figure something else out. <laughs> so I just say that to say, though, it's looking at the, the progression of the church. And maybe I'll throw this out there. I don't know if the conversation will go that way. But when we talk about the kingdom, we're now talking about a generation that can go and and Google kingdom theology, but they may sit under a pastor or their their mother sat under a pastor who could not properly articulate kingdom theology to them. Yep. So now we're dealing with this divide where as uh, me and Thurston, we had this congregation, I mean conversation even in how we understand our theology. He understands his theology as a junior, uh, as the junior of his father, but the oldest in his family. Yes, sir. I'm the junior of my father, but I'm the youngest in my family. Um, my father was the youngest of all of the old preachers. He was the little guy that was, you know, helping all the, you know, he, he remembers the stories about the legendary Reverend Stowers, and, you know, all these, that kind of thing, you know. But now that he's gone, and now that we've got Bishop Campbell in the city, another young guy uh, who was, who was, you know, for in the Church of God in Christ, who was the popular, you know, evangelist for the younger people, but now they're gone. Yeah. And so now even that theology of how we articulate both the kingdom and the church and how that applies in our everyday experience is now being articulated by a different group of people to a different group of people. Yes, so sir. one polarization that I see even greater right now is who are we preaching to and what are we saying? Because again, Ricky, you used to you used to you used to be the featured vocalist for the youth choir. Well, ain't no youth choir. <laughs> you know, there's no such thing as a youth no, choir. Anymore. Not not the youth world. choir is is the children who are forced to come to church. Right. <laughs> You know, but this is the progression we're talking about. So, so when we do come come to building, whenever we can come to building, what does coming to building look like now? Because you can't spit and stomp and emote and sweat because those are germs and the virus is still real and it's still <laughs> in the land. Yeah. So um, I just that's what I see. Where where we? How do we get this next generation to understand? I think it's like this, the importance of kingdom principles without losing 
the the social importance of the black church community and what that gathering means to us. So I, I think th th this is so critical. And Stephen, I'm, I'm bringing you into this conversation. So you're now a guest co-host. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 bring, I'm recruiting you into this because here's the question I want to pose to all three of you. How do we integrate and synthesize a transformational paradigm into an institutional context wow. without us being guilty of putting new wine in old wine skins. Wow. How, so I'm going to ask my question one more time. <laughs> How do we integrate and synthesize a transformational paradigm which is necessary not only to thrive but even to survive? Mm -hmm. How do we integrate and synthesize a transformational paradigm into an institutional context because the lineages and the and the legacies that we represent all come out of an institutional context so how do we do that without being guilty of trying to force something into something that it was never designed for whoever wants to start i'll jump in some things have to die, some things you have to kill. And we have to be specific and strategic in how we move forward and not being afraid to lay that lamb on the altar and chop its neck off and move in a new direction. I'm a car guy. I went to school initially to design cars. Many people don't know that. That was my track. <clears throat> so we can look at the automotive industry and they do the same thing. One of my favorite cars is the Ford Thunderbird. I want an old 50-something Thunderbird. I'd love to have that. And a couple of years ago, uh, in the early 2000s, they did a remake of the old school Thunderbird. Some of the same features, some of the same characteristics, but it had all of the modern technology that was built into it. And so from an ocular perspective, it looked something like the old piece. But from a technological perspective, it was way different. And I think that same concept and principle need to be applied to how we do ministry. We can still have some semblance of, but how we actually engage it looks totally different. Wow. First of all, I didn't know you went to school to design cars, brother. And <laughs> but, but now I see your style and how you flow. I was like, ah. It, it makes, makes sense, sense now, huh? It makes sense. It makes <laughs> sense. Uh, aesthetic design, uh, man, what what a what a heavy question. And Thurston alluded to carving and cutting as opposed to replacing. And one of the things that we had to do, and again, consider culture, consider context is as we moved into this pandemic season, pastors, church leaders, if there's ever a time where you wanted to carve, cut, and slice, this is the window of opportunity to do it. The reason being, nothing is normal. And the reason I, I, I lean in and start with that, it's hard to go back to normal, Ricky, when normal no longer exists. Right very difficult. And the people who want to go back to normal are the ones whose skill set was designed for the old normal. Yes. And their past successes put them in a position to want to preserve that normal. So in asking that question, I can take a page out of our book. Any type of transformation from you know, where I sit and what I've discovered, any type of transformation of mindset is a three to five year plan. And, and I say that because the first two years are all about chopping, cutting, and deprogramming. And what I mean by that is we had to spend about three about three or four years to get to the point where we are now. And, and, and what I mean by that, 
the overall goal I had in my mind was the priesthood of believer, returning the priesthood to believers, returning the priesthood to the believers, so that wherever believers are, the kingdom manifests. Yes. That was the long game. And walking back from the long game, so what did I have to do? I spent an entire year teaching on the kingdom of God. I spent the second year teaching on the priesthood of the believer. And then we implemented the aspect of where the head of household would now become the priests and the head of their homes and therefore administering communion and baptism. Y- y- y'all catch this. Wow. I'm with you, sir. We had heads of households, fathers, and even some mothers serving communion because for us, uh, you were considered a church attender if you just attended once a month. And and I'm not one of those pastors who fudge my numbers. I don't, I mean, I don't That's lie. Right. I'm as transparent as I can be. So therefore, we go to where they are because if you look at Jesus's model, wherever Jesus was, the kingdom was manifest. You better yeah. watch it, stores. You sounding like the book of Acts. Stephen, you got <laughs> you got your organ over there. You got your Casio. <laughs> I got I got hoop triggers. I yeah, can we, I can cue it we up gonna hoop need triggers. It. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> you starting to sound like Bible up in here now. Why, hey, man? And 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 so uh, in teaching that, fellas, uh, man, it took time. And then the third year was all about implementation and adaptation. We're gonna try this out. And language is is crucial. You got to get the language right. And the language was, hey, we're gonna try this. And if it doesn't work, we can always go back to the way it was. But let's give it a try. I don't want to be a pastor who didn't try. And guess what? We tried it, and we had people to take pictures, film it, post it, so people could see themselves doing what you do. Yeah. And we never went back. We never went back. And I think pastors may not spend enough time and underestimate what they can do in five years and overestimate what they can do in one year. You, you, like just, you just said something that's very critical. Uh, all civilizations uh, are formed around three foundations, language and lexicon, uh, belief systems and customs and traditions. And so if there's any shift that's going to be made in a civilization or in a culture, the first thing you've got to look at is what are we saying? What's the lexicon? What, what, what's the colloquial that's necessary to transfer whatever the ideas or ideals are? And then what are the normatives that we're going to put in place to help us to carry out whatever it is that we say our ideals are. And so those are the things that that have to be looked at. Uh, I I shared a book with with Stephen a couple of days ago. I believe he posted about it. Uh, It's the Post-Quarantine Church uh, Mm -hmm. by Tom Rayner. It's six urgent challenges and opportunities uh, that determine the future of your congregation. Here's something Tom Rayner said just in the introduction. He talks about um, at least four catastrophic events in his life that he remembers that made an indelible impression on him. Uh, He said the first experience was the assassination of JFK. Uh, Second was the Challenger explosion that had Krista McAuliffe on it, the first teacher to go into space. Third for him was 9-11. And then, of course, the fourth was this pandemic. Tom Rayner said, he said, here's what's intriguing about this when it comes to the church. The first three events that he cites, he said those events led people to the church. With the fourth one he cites, the pandemic shuts down the church. He says, with the first three, we know when they ended. 
with this fourth one, we don't know where the end is. Yeah. And, and so I, I think it's important for us and, and stores both you and, and Bill and Steven, I mean, y'all are nailing, uh, nailing things right on the head. I think the thing that has to be visited, and I was talking to you stores in the virtual green room about this theology of building. I need you to talk about that. Yeah. Um, because I, I think what has to be understood is a lot of leaders has conflated, have been conflating church to kingdom. And, and they, they've just said, because I'm doing church, this has to be kingdom. First of all, there's you can't have that conflation. At best, you've created an inflation. Because in order for church to become kingdom, there's a vertical movement. <laughs> yeah. You you gotta be moving up from, from what you know and what your norm is into the unknown. And somebody, I think it was you stores made the statement that we really have to take normal out of the equation. I, yes. And I told Stephen this even before we came on the day. Yeah. I was like, we're just at a point now where the, the operative word is just new. Which correlates with evolution. Just throw normal away. Don't even don't even try to operate in any context. It has no definition to it. Normal. You've got to, if you're thinking kingdom, you're thinking evolution. You're thinking faith to faith. You're thinking glory to glory. It, it's this vertical trajectory that is designed to reveal by relationship organically the rest of what God has already ordered. So, so I, I want you to talk stories to this theology of building because I think a lot of yes. people find themselves stuck there. And we want to we want to jolt them free uh, so that they can embrace this transformational paradigm and so that the building will not become a limitation or a liability, but it becomes a launching pad. Absolutely. Uh, I would love to to converse. And and here goes my uh, old guy analogy again. You know, old guys like to tell stories. We like to put frames <laughs> around uh, right. conversation. So let me couch this. Let me frame this first, and then I'll land the plane. Uh, as succinctly as I can. African Americans, and I need to speak through the lens of an African American because I believe it is a valid interpretive uh, method, uh, along with scripture, seeing scripture through the lens, my through the lens of, of the African American experience. Historically, African Americans have three areas in which we've dominated and have shown proudness. Number one, entertainment. Secondly, athletics. And thirdly, the church. Athletics, entertainment, church. Within athletics, we own no teams. We don't hold historically, the decision-making positions. Entertainment, we have heard countless of stories of artists not owning their masters and dying broke, things of that sort. And we don't own any labels, any major labels. But in the church, think about this. Sorry. We own that building. I can come, I can be a janitor in the CPS school, but now I'm a deacon at my church who owns this building. So that, that's the mentality where we find ourselves. And people struggle to get that building. People sacrifice to get the building. I remember as a as a kid. We used to have gleaners. That's old school where you would put the yeah. little quarters yeah. in the little slots and you have to turn your gleaner the in. Cards. Yeah, I remember those. Yes. yes. Because even as children, we wanted to participate in owning the building. We didn't own anything else. We were mostly renters. 
Think about it. We just recently gotten into home ownership after the Housing Act uh, yes. was passed in, in, in 64. So that's a short history of ownership. And the two main things we primarily own are homes, cars, and our church building. Now, you couple that with people have said goodbye to loved ones at the building. People have gotten married at that building. People have had significant life-changing experiences at that building. So now I'm equating the building with my connection to God, with my connection to owning something in a world that takes everything away from me. This is why we're tied to buildings. And it's also the same reason why when churches build a new building, it's very difficult for people to connect in that new space. Because again, it goes back to that theology of place. And this is why it takes time to change the thought process. It takes time to get the language right so that people could see that same transformative experience you had in that building we own, but now hinders us from doing ministry like we know we can, can happen anywhere when you have the kingdom mindset. And by far, this is probably one of the most difficult leadership challenges that I've experienced thus far is getting people to shift to being a priest in their own homes, decentralizing the church so that we can in turn be freed up to do ministry globally. I'm gonna just open the doors of the church, Steve, and you whatever you want to do. <laughs> I, I'm between him and Bill. I'm opening the doors of the church. I, I'm. Yeah, let's just wrap this up because they just hitting. Yeah, I'm ready. Take me to the wall. <laughs> that, that's why. <laughs> just so rich. Hey, it's hey, so Bill, critical, quick. and and this is a again, this is an ongoing conversation, and I, I I'm not trying to commit you all. Uh, since I have you all captive here on this platform, but this is an ongoing conversation. Even as we go into 21, uh, you, you got to come back again because we're helping leaders navigate this uncharted frontier. Uh, for us on this platform, we've been exploring this to various degrees sure. over the years because we've had the vantage point of standing on the shoulders of other pioneers. So that's in our blood. We, we, we have a pioneering spirit, uh, but we got a lot of other leaders out there that uh, didn't have that, what I would consider a luxury. Uh, and so as a result of that, they, they thought that church was designed to be monolithic, you know, and, and stayed and, and they're discovering, particularly in pandemic, oh, this thing is fluid. Yeah. Oh, oh, he really meant that when he talked about living water that that's ever <laughs> flowing and ever moving. Uh, okay, my paradigm has got to shift. Where do I start with this? So th this is this is necessary conversation. So again, thank you all. But Stephen, yeah. uh segue us here and uh and and, and let's 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 help the pastor who's watching this, who's who's burdened by the theology of place, uh, who who's serving a people who are faithful, who are diligent, and the stores point that building represents everything that gives them identity. Hmm. You know, one of the things I've often said is it's interesting to me that within church culture, which is different than the kingdom, but in church culture, a person can be absolutely unequivocally insignificant in every other area of their life within the sociological construct, but appear to be everything <laughs> yeah. when they walk through the doors of that building at that particular address. Yeah. 
And, hey, Rick, and so speak to that and and as, as we move forward here. Yeah, I think the, the conversation that one pastor need to have in their mind is, do I want to be a legend or do I want to become legendary? Wow. Say that once more time. Say it yeah, for please. the old guy. <laughs> the, the internal conversation has to be, am I going to be a legend or am I going to become legendary? Because when I focus on becoming a <laughs> legend, it, it's insular. It's all focused on me. It's about my ego. It's about this monument called the church building that I've built and raised funds for un, really unto myself. It, it was to establish myself amongst the other clergy. Um, so they could say, hey, this guy's really doing it or he, he's made it. That's what all the building stuff was about. If we be honest and cut the bullshit out the game. Yeah. That, that's that's what it was about because there were actually better usage of the funds and then they screwed us these white contractors and builders screwed us because black people never built nothing that big before or spent that much money and then ego wouldn't allow us to talk to somebody else who's built something to see how they're screwing us and then take that advice and not get screwed so again it all goes back to self because self wanted to be a legend but his reality What's going to live beyond you and be bigger than you is if you position yourself to be legendary. What did you do to make a mark, not a scar on people's lives and the kingdom of God? How did you propel the kingdom? How did you make the kingdom greater? How did you make people better? What are they going to talk about 30, 40, 50 years from now? It's not going to be the building that you built, but how you revolutionize the community, how you change and impact people's lives, how you shifted people from being renters to being owners to set up generational wealth, how you provided a pathway towards education, not just Christian education, but secular education, how you changed the lives of the people in the community that had records and had murders in their history, but now they're business owners and operators and they're able to provide for their family and make the community larger and better. How have you equipped people to be the hands and the feet of Jesus? When we focus our shift from being legends to being legendary, something that's bigger than us. And again, the building, sir, ma'am, that's not what's bigger than you because gentrification can come into that community and wipe out that building and nobody will ever know 10 years from now that you built this monstrosity unto yourself. That's where our focus has to shift. That's, that's what has to drive our core and our core values concerning ministry. Hopefully that answered you, Rick. But let me shift a little bit. This is off, off course, but uh, with, with us having Bill here and as we celebrate and honor his dad, and we have pastors that are watching us because Ricky and Clarence, you all have been in that position of losing father slash pastor. Speak to Bill and others because one day that will be my story. I'll be sitting in the seat yes. that Bill sits in. Help us and knowing how to minister to the needs of a hurting congregation, but still moving that ministry forward. Wow, I'd be honored, I'd be honored. And my dad passed in 1999 and we were midway through a three year planned transition in leadership. And unfortunately, our Lord called him home to be with him during the midway through that, that transition. We had a 30 day mourning period where we draped the church, all of the above. And, and then we had our unveiling service and immediately I was installed as pastor. And, and thus began my, my journey in uh, May. This was May of uh, 1999. I saw my dad's demise up close and the grieving for me was ongoing. It wasn't sudden. So I had a chance to adjust to what was happening and seeing the demise and, and all be it. And when he finally uh, breathed his last breath and I knew that I was going to, to lead the congregation, uh, my dad had a meeting prior to that while he was still healthy to say, okay, here's the next pastor and we want you to support him as you did me. And so that went well. And during that transition, first thing I've learned, well, I'll give you three quick lessons because I've been journaling about this ever since. Wow. First thing, I should have taken more time. I should not have gone in and led the congregation. I should have took more time 
to really grieve and process, really grieve and process. But uh, our church were, had plateaued, and I knew I had to get in and get to work and, and make some necessary changes. So take time to process and take time to, to grieve, because if you don't do number one, then number two will be apparent, and that is grief will ambush you. Uh, it'll hit you at moments where you weren't ready. Uh, it'll hit you uh, just hearing uh, your dad's voice or reminiscing on a special family memory. Man, it hit me last night when I was watching the Fresh Prince reunion. Mm. And and they were showing the part, if you haven't seen it, spoiler alert. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when they were showing the part uh, about James Avery, the, the character who played Will's uh, Uncle Phil, man, it hit me because I was reminiscing on the memories that my dad and I had. So grief will ambush you. And if you don't take the proper time to uh, process and heal from that, you'll be ambushed. Thirdly, let grief run its course. There is no timetable on grieving. Uh, your dad was a legendary dude, and we're all a part and connected to legendary guys. And those guys, you, you just can't grieve in one day. You can't grieve them in one week. Legendary dudes <laughs> uh, will have long runways of, of grief, and, and we have to let that uh, run its course, and that grief has no timetable. And then uh, finally, I would say and share, so much of Bishop E, who's been set free, is in you and your family. So the legend will live on, and you'll start sounding like your dad. You'll start hearing people say, when you move like this, it reminds me of Bishop E., the lessons that you've learned, internalize them. And that's how legends live forever. But I'll close with this. Now that he's with the Lord, focus on what's left and not what's lost. And what's left is your family, your wife, your children, your congregation, your friends. And in meantime, and during that um, time, it'll allow you to heal on God's timetable. That, that 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 was that was excellent. I, and 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 stores, thank you for for speaking to it because just based on what you just shared, your situation would be most similar to Bill's process. He and I have been meeting up and hanging out, so he we've been talking as brothers uh, yeah. through this. Um, and and he was asking questions because he, he knows how close. I was to my father, but unlike you and Ellis, my father passed suddenly. Um, he was 57, been pastoring over 30 years, uh, multiple churches at one time, went on holiday with my mother to Italy and uh, was just on a bunch of flights uh, legs not able to stretch. Now this this is a guy. Bill knows this is a guy. Got up every morning four thirty to pray. Highly disciplined. Air Force Academy grad. Uh, jogged eight miles a day, six days a week. You know that kind of guy. Highly disciplined. Never been in the hospital <laughs> a day in his life. Never broke a bone. No pre existing conditions. No health problems. Gets back from Italy. He's preaching his third service. He sits down after the service and tells my mother, you know what? I feel this pain in my lower right leg that I felt last Sunday. You know how we do as guys. We don't talk about it right when it happens. Between him telling her that and they call the ambulance, he gets in the ambulance. They get him to the hospital. He's in the hospital room. And they say, how you feel? And he say, you know, I'm good, except these people around here crying, whatever. Raises his hand, says, I'm gone. Now, the irony is I'm preaching 
in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is where my mother and father are from. At the moment he passes, guess who's sitting in my audience? His mom and dad. At the moment he passes. I'll never forget, I'm between services when I find out. My brother texts me and I say to God in the restroom of the office, God, if you'd have left him here, we'd have made sure he got rest because we were always on him for, you know, just how he went. And God said, so you would get him more rest than I can give him? Mm. Like he just, he didn't even have a discussion with me. He's like, I'm, I'm not doing this with you, Ricky. This is done. This is a wrap. And I'll never forget preaching a message to his church called Between Two Worlds. And I use Enoch as the biblical character. And the Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was not because God took him. And I said, let me tell you about my dad. Destiny didn't exhaust him. He exhausted his destiny. Mm. And, and, you know, and, and I, now I have said, well, you know what? I, I, I wish he would have just, you know, been here. I, I'd probably been better if he had to deal with something. But then I, I've, I've watched Bill, handle his father's situation with courage and compassion and care stories. You just talked about watching your father decline. And I'm like, no, nah, I don't think I wanted that. Like there, there's no win in this. You know what I'm saying? Like whether he goes suddenly or whether it's over time, there, there's no good situation in this. But the one thing I will say to you, Bill, from, from a personal perspective and just to reiterate one thing that Clarence said, and that is allow yourself to feel it. Like, don't, don't try to numb yourself to that feeling with busyness, with pastoral responsibilities. Don't overcompensate. Uh, you got a safe place with your wife, with my nieces and all of their big personalities. So your dad is already living on <laughs> Absolutely. in another generation. Absolutely. If you all have met Bill's daughters, you understand that legacy is secure, even with these <laughs> precious princesses. Um, but yeah, give yourself, for, I'll, I'll tell you in, in full disclosure, for one year, and, I j and then here's the other part. I just got married. I was the last wedding that my father performed. And he passed on my wife's birthday. That was the first birthday I was celebrating with her as my wife. We had just gotten married September 3rd of 2011. He passed April 15, 2012. And I'm in the throes of ministry, pastoring, traveling, doing everything. For one solid year, I cried every day. I, I would have to come out and preach to conferences of thousands. And before I came out, would be balled up on the bathroom floor, literally screaming. My wife rubbing my back. And, just, and, and what she said to me that helped me, with all the leaders that called me and friends who I appreciate, who gave me words of comfort and counsel, the greatest words came from the woman that God gave me. She said, allow yourself to feel it. And she covered me for one year. I mean, and nobody else knew because, I mean, I was functioning. You know what I'm saying? It, it, didn't, it didn't debilitate or cripple me. But it actually gave me release. And for one solid year, I cried every day. You know, and people, I, I would almost dread people asking me about him. You know, because I'm like, do they understand? If I try to talk right now, the, my eyes going to water up. And I'm trying to keep my composure. And then I, you know, when they walked away or went away, I'm just, I am broke down again. Uh, and then one day, it just didn't affect me like that. And like Storr said, you know, anything can trigger it, whether it's the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air reunion. Like this year, I, I had a moment, I want to say from Father's Day, June, to his birthday in August, man, it, you would have thought he just passed. And I hadn't felt that since 2012. Didn't understand it. I woke up on, I think it was like the day before Father's Day. I had a dream about it. And I woke up and man, I was just, and it, Bill, I saw you doing that time. I think Steve and I talked to you about it. Yep. And it just, I mean, it was on me. Like it was, 
And so what I do, I'm open about it. And I, and I told my wife, hey, look, I'm feeling dad right now, you know. And uh, so that's what I tell you. Just allow yourself to feel it. And of course, you got brothers here uh, who understand it, uh, who, who've been through it. So we've got you covered as well as the company uh, of people that are connected to your life that form your village. Uh, I, I want to say this in closing to, to the pastors that are watching. I want to remind you of what the kingdom mandate is. It's what I call the five E's. And, and because no matter what happens with this pandemic, if you'll stay true to the mandate of the kingdom, your church will not only survive, your church will thrive. And, and I want you to mark these five things that I tell you. You, you may not be the best at navigating social media. You, you may not have uh, the best technology tools for your live stream. But if you'll find a way, and with God's help, you will. If you'll find a way to stay true to these five E's and measure yourself by a kingdom mandate, I promise you, you'll come out of this better than you went in. Number one, the first E is evangelize. Reach, make that your first priority to reach beyond yourself, reach beyond your walls. As a matter of fact, whatever you're planning as you go into 2021, don't do it from the inside out, do it from the outside in. Consider the community around you, consider the city you're in, consider the needs uh, that people have in their life and then plan whatever your ministry objectives are, not according to what you want to do within your congregation, but how your congregation can best serve the world beyond your walls, your doors, and your immediate parishion. So number one is evangelize, which is to reach. Once you reach them, number two is edify, which is to touch. My dad used to always say, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. <laughs> so after you reach them, you got to touch them. So you got to edify them. But it's not enough to make them feel better. Number three, you want to educate. You want to teach. I heard Storrs talk about it that when he was leading his church into a culture shift that he spent a year teaching them. Yes, sir. Talk to them. Sh shift your pedagogy. Find, find a different way. This, they, don't, they don't need your hoop. They know you can sing and you got 10 octaves. That's wonderful. But that's not what they need from you right now. They, they, they need the calm of a, of a steady voice that's giving them tools for transformation. So, so number three is, is, is educate, teach. But don't stop there. Number four is to equip them, which is to train them. Make sure you give them the tools so that that teaching can become application in their life. And then number five, after you've equipped them, empower them, which means you lead them in a process of transformation so that they can become all that they were created to be. So remember that evangelize is reach, edify is touch, educate is teach, Equip is train and then transformation, which comes when you empower them to carry out the work that they've called to do. This has been the revolution will not be televised. It will be streamed with your hosts, Ricky Allman and Stephen Thurston and our amazing erudite, insightful, anointed co-hosts, Pastor Bill Ellis, Pastor Clarence Stores. Thank you all for joining us. You all enjoy your Saturday. We'll holler at you. And Pleasure. happy Thanksgiving, by the way, because when you see this, you're heading into Thanksgiving. Please social distance. Please don't invite Big Mama and them. She already 90. We want her to stay alive. Don't do it. All right. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>